We know not Welcome, my friends. You're listening to the voice of the Eternal Gospel, a program brought to you by the Eternal Gospel Ministry. Founded in 1992 by Seventh day Adventist believers, this is a Christian program dedicated to bring you the prophetic fulfillment, warning, and revelations of the end times, and to promote the advancement of Christ in your life. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Pastor Rafael Perez, and um, I got with me this beautiful panel. My brother Paul, can you introduce yourself again? I am Paul Forrest. I am a nurse by profession and an elder with the Eternal Gospel Church. I enjoy studying and sharing the Word. I'm glad to have you aboard today. My brother Jose. Yes, happy to be here again. My name is Jose Rivera. I'm with Patient Faith Ministry and I'm an evangelist. My brother, Patrick. Nice to be back. My name's Patrick Jones from Tennessee, and I'm with the Three Angels Publishing. Praise God. Again, welcome back, all of you. Thank you. Into the program. And as you know, we are hosting this program, and uh, the reason that we are taking on the book of Daniel, as we mentioned in previous uh, program, is because we have seen so far that in the book of Daniel, there are revelations prophecies, and signs for this end time. And before we continue into that book, let's go ahead and ask for heavenly guidance. Let's ask for the Holy Spirit to come and help you to understand it as long with us to present it as clearly as we can in this program. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the opportunity to study thy word. Help us, O oh, oh Lord, to send us with the, through your Holy Spirit, not only to understand the time that we're living, but to understand thy word. It is in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. 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 Okay. And on the book of Daniel chapter 2, we, we already talked in previous program about the beautiful stone that all of us are looking for. Isn't it? And that stone we mentioned that is represented by the second coming of Christ. But be just before that, before the stone will hit this earth, which will hit and destroy all the kings, the kingdoms, everything. As a matter of fact, Second Peter 3.10. Jose, can you read it? Before, before we go back again to bring one more detail on chapter 2 of the book of uh, Daniel, but... Uh, I want to bring that, according to the Bible, the only people that are going to survive when Jesus will come are going to be the true church of Christ, the true people of God. That's right. And, why, and you're going to see why, in a few minutes, why I'm making emphasis on the true people, the true church of Christ. The rest of the whole world is going to be destroyed. Second Peter 3, 10, please. And it reads, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heaven shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Because in the book of Daniel chapter 2, we see just prior to the stone, the second coming of Christ under this earth, there will be a mingling of something, my brother Patrick. Go ahead, take off. Take off right there. Well, Daniel, actually Nebuchadnezzar, saw in his dream that the iron in the legs would be, that clay would mingle in with the iron at the feet. And that's where the stone hits the clay, hits the image. So, uh, the iron, we know that it is represented by what, Rosie? By the kingdom or the empire of Rome. Pagan Rome. The pagan Rome. Right. Well, I mean, even the Catholic Bible, if I read the commentary, uh, you know, they will agree with us. Yes. That the fourth kingdom, all the theologians agree. History tells us that next to Greece, Rome came in. That's right. Okay. So there's no argument with that. But the mingling with the iron and the clay, what would the clay would represent then? Well, the clay would represent a people of God. Let me explain. 
If you go to Jeremiah chapter 18, mm. you can read in verse 6 something about the Bible speaking about clay. Mm. In verse 6 of Jeremiah 18, it reads, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in my hand, O house of Israel. This is referring to the people of God. And there's another verse, I, I want to say it's in Isaiah 64. Isaiah 64. Verse 8. Thank you, brother. Verse 8. But now, O Lord, Thou art our Father, we are the clay, and Thou our potter, and we all are the work of Thy hand. But wait a minute, right there. See, okay, clay is a symbol of God's people. The church. But, uh, church. But... In the book of Daniel, chapter 2, it present, it brings us, we read in there that it is like a mighty, mighty clay. Miry clay, yeah. And, and what does that mean? A mighty. Miry. Or, or miry. Um, God wants us to be soft, moldable clay. His church should be like uh, soft clay in his hands. Right. But in Daniel 2, this is a miry clay, which is a clay that has other hard in components in it, and it's unworkable. Could, it's, could that be describing then a church that might be, uh, even though they might have God's people in there, but the structure or the institution is not being well represented before the Lord? Yes, you see here in verse 41, back in Daniel chapter 2, you'll notice the verse starts off by speaking that this clay was potter's clay. But by the time that you get to the end of the verse, it was transformed into miry clay. And I, I cannot help but to think this is because of their attempts in mingling with the Roman influence. Notice iron is still even in the feet. That's a good point. Anytime a church joins with the state, the doctrines are lowered, doctrines are changed. And so potter's clay becomes miry clay. Hmm. That's such a deep and important uh, a point to get it from the Word of God. Because exactly history tells us that the apostolic church, the church of the New Testament, what happened to that pure doctrines that the Jesus and the apostle were preaching up to the death, the death of John, let's say, the last disciple, what history tells us that happened to Christianity right after, during the Roman Empire, what was happening to the church? Well, the disciples maintained a purity in the church until the last of them died. John died about 100 AD. And then there was still, the church was being persecuted until the time of Constantine in about 313 AD. He became the first Christian emperor. And that, that date marks when the Clay started mingling with the... And becoming uh, a mighty clay? Miry so clay. That's right. Yeah. Uh, did I pronounce it yeah. okay? Miry. He started... Uh, miry. I mean, with mud. Is that right? It's basically, like a, yes. Basically, yeah. Not a good clay. That's right. Constantine started using the Bishop of Rome and the Christian church in his government. I mean, I want our viewers to pay attention to this and, and read and ministers too. I'm glad to to know, to read, and to receive phone calls from ministers across the land, viewing this program, watch, uh, hearing the program through a nationwide radio programs that we have, English and Spanish and in French, and, uh, and and this program is, you know, to bring everybody, you know, to it's for, 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 for laity and clergy. So, again, and I know no, none of us wants to be part of a mighty Clay. That's right, the miry clay. That's right. Okay. Yes, Paul. Jesus uh, speaking of his churches, the first in the sequence was the Ephesus church. He says in uh, Revelation 2 and verse uh, 2, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, how thou canst not bear them which are evil. Uh -huh. But by the time we get to verse 4, he says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Mm -hmm. So here we see the church begin drifting. And as you go through chapter 
2 and it, chapter 3, you see the decline in the purity of the church. Yeah, of Revelation. And, and we're going to get into that. Don't worry about it. But uh, I just want to make sure that we understand that, yes, clay is a symbol of God's people, as we have read in Jeremiah, Isaiah, and, and so on. But the clay that is being presented over there is not a good it's clay. Not a good clay. Right. And, and, and history, again, tell us, and, and you were explaining what was taking place specifically according to, to church history uh, during the third and the second century. Yeah, let, let me make this statement about that miry clay is not a good clay. If you notice, when the stone actually smites the image, verse 34 of Daniel 2 says, or verse 35, it says, Then was the iron, and it says, The clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold, broke into pieces together, even this, if I may say, apostasy of Christians, this apostate representative clay, even the clay will be destroyed with the stone representing the second coming of Jesus. That's a good point too. And obviously, the pure clay, the true church, the true God's people are not going to be destroyed. Right. Because the Bible, and we will get into this, tell us that that's the reason that God is coming is to bring His church, His people to heaven with Him. But what kind of a church is He going to come for? According to Ephesians. Oh yeah, a church without spot, without wrinkle. Can, can, can or any you such read thing? it? Because our viewers He's, might not uh, know what we know. And we tend to believe that everybody, you know, at chapter 6 yes, of it's, Ephesians. It's Ephesians, verse, actually it's Ephesians 5, uh, beginning verse, in verse... 26, okay, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So, going about the clay again, that church is, cannot be represented by a miry condition. Miry clay condition that's right apostasy was coming that's right if you if you just look up the simple uh definition of miry it just means useless dirt that's all it means okay. useless uh, okay i like that it's that muck you get mired on in when you're driving through mud. <laughs> <laughs> yes brother Matthew. And, Matthew. In, and in history that's what came into the church it was during this time when uh the church was uniting with the state that pagan customs the paganism of rome came into the church, you have uh, Sunday worship coming in, because most of the world was worshiping the sun the first day of the week, but the uh, Bishop of Rome exalted Sunday worship on Sunday, and also various other idols, and idols. images, and... Uh, Praying to the dead. Yeah. Right? Various other pagan Well, you customs. mentioned Constantine a couple of minutes ago. Uh, Encyclopedia Britannica, it says very clearly that something took place in the year 321st. Mm -hmm. But let's hold right there. We'll be right back and we're going to pick up in this such an important topic. With powerful reenactments and incredible visual effects, this 95-minute masterpiece brings to life the book of Revelation like never before. Revelation is no longer a mystery. Get your copy today. Welcome back, my brother Patrick. So you, you were mentioning just before the break that during the first centuries, the church, the Christian church, the pure church of Christ, they start falling away from the truth. And by the time of the fourth century around there, something was happening between Constantine and the bishop of Rome. Go ahead. It's very interesting in history what happened. Um, you had the iron in the statue that Daniel saw, and that represented pagan Rome. Pagan Rome was persecuting the Christian church, and the worst of the persecution was under the emperor Diocletian around 300 AD for 10 years. Solid years of persecution. Immediately, Constantine became the next emperor, and he, was, he became a Christian First, the first Christian emperor, immediately the persecution ceased. April 1st Christian, let's yeah. put it up. Okay. 
And that's when the clay started mixing in because he used the bishop of Rome, worked closely with him, and the Christian church started becoming part of the Roman government. And that process continued on through the Dark Ages, and that's why the Roman Catholic Church, it's the only church that that clay would, could represent. At that time? Well, you, you, you mean the mighty clay? That's right, at that time. Yeah. At that time, because let's not forget that God always has had his people, no? His pure, and, and even within inside Roman Catholicism, no doubt there were they, they, they were at that time, they're still there, you know, God's true children, isn't it? We're talking about the system. That's why I want to I want to distinguish. And we're talking about the the, 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 not the good clay, mighty clay, I guess you pronounce it? Yes, miry clay, yeah. Okay, yes, that clay is going to be destroyed when Jesus comes, represented by a false, you know, a church, okay, popular, mingling the doctrines of Jesus with the pagan doctrines. And you mentioned that one example was the sanctity of Sunday. Yes. Right? It was during that time that pagan customs came into the Christian church because whenever you unite the church and the state, and the Roman Catholic Church is the original union of church and state uh, under Christianity right. or a false Christianity, mm -hmm. uh, doctrines are lowered and, and changed. And that's when pagan customs started mixing, coming in uh, and Sunday keeping, which is a tradition not found in the Word of God, started coming into the, being exalted by the Bishop of Rome. Yes, Constantine wanted to grow the church and hence himself as well. He wanted to please both the pagan and heathen worshipers along with the Christians, and he sought to... What were they doing at that time? When were they worshiping? Say that again? When were the heathen worshiping? Yeah, That's what right. What day of the week they were, right. were they worshiping? Yes, That's well, the, the highest heathen god historically and everywhere is the sun god, Baal. Wait, wait a minute. What does the word... Sunday means day of the sun. Day of the sun. All right, that's good, right? Paul, you were going to say something. I, I know you, you, you're listening, and I know you know you also are very knowledgeable of what was taking place at that time, and there was no doubt. In it shouldn't be no doubt in our mind that God is one wants to re, us to reveal all these things because. We, he wants us to be part of his true church, his true people. When I say we, including our viewers. Isn't that true? That's right. That's right. Now, when you look at Daniel, uh, from this story that we just read, Daniel came into Babylon as nothing, a slave, a eunuch, and he served the king. But the story closes with the king bowing down in verse 47 and worshipping Daniel. Mm. The rules have been reversed. You're talking about the king Nebuchadnezzar. Yes. Nebuchadnezzar. Yes. I, I, I just want to be, be, before we keep going into there, I, I want to leave this very clear, what was taking place during the first centuries, especially during the fourth century, because that's when, historically speaking, that's when we find all this mingling of pure church, with pagan, I mean, pure doctrines, the doctrines of Jesus, the doctrines of, of, of the disciples, and the doctrines of men. And, and I believe, if we look at closely, until today, the majority of our dear uh, friends and brethren out there, uh, uh, friends, they are, they, are, they are following those man-made traditions. That's right, that's right. You know, I can't help but to think of the origin of Babylon. If you go back to Genesis 10, it speaks about Nimrod, and he was the mighty hunter, and his kingdom was the beginning points of Babylon, and everyone remembers the story of Babel. It represented the story brought in confusion, and, and Babylon to this day has that mingling idea that brings confusion, just like the devil wanted to confuse Adam and Eve, and he says... Take of this tree, it has good and evil. You bring that together, you have religious confusion. Hence, we see it today. Yes. Oh, brother Paul. Paul, Paul saw the very beginnings of this corruption 
coming into the church, and he wrote about it in uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Okay. He says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, the coming of the Lord, shall not come except there come a falling away first, mm. and that man of sin be revealed. Exactly. Uh, verse 4, this is what he, is, he, he will do, who oppose it and exalt it himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God seated in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So we have a transition from Christ into a man taking God's place. And Paul saw the beginnings of that. And, and Paul is presenting that this was going to be seen before Christ will come. B before the stone. I'm talking about the, the Daniel language, exactly. chapter it's, 2. It's so before relevant. the stone will come and, and destroy all this mighty clay, the, the, the ugly clay, the bad clay, and the iron, and the, everything. Um, he saw that this was going to take place what my brother Paul is reading over there. That's right. Yes, for Paul says, for this mystery of iniquity doth already work. That's right, verse 7. Well, mystery, uh, what should that remind us? Because in the book of Revelation, the modern day Babylon, it is, the name is what? Mystery. mystery. Yeah, that's right. Babylon. But you want to you, you keep... Uh... Two points I'd like to bring out. One is that when a church loses the power of the gospel, and the gospel is God's power to save us from our sins, when it loses the power of the gospel, it turns to the power of the state. And th that's the clay mingling with the iron, church with state. A bad clay. I want Bad to keep reminding. Clay. Yes, miry clay mingling with the iron. And when that is, then people are not changed from within with a new heart. Instead, the church uses the power of the state to force people into a unity, into a false worship, and to be changed from, from, by laws, by human enact, enactments. And but that's opposite from the principle of God. Yes. So God wants us to obey him and to follow him from our heart yeah. not by force L let me just uh add on to that and then i'll let you go on to your second point patrick what he just mentioned is seen in very many bible examples you remember the jews who were not accepting of christ and his ministry mingled together with the state Pilate, the roman at that time and as a result the christian became persecuted Likewise, in the days of Jezebel and King Ahab, Ahab is a king. Jezebel is some apostate sun worshiper, by the way. That's right. She was the high, the high princess or queen of, of Baal. They come together. Elijah is the one that becomes persecuted. This mixture of church and state, this idea of iron and clay, this idea of truth mingling with error has always caused... The disaster. wrath of God and disaster of God. And, disaster for God. And it's, good, it's so relevant for us to bring this at this very time because during this time we hear, you know, many good people out there saying, churches, church leaders, it doesn't matter so much, how, you know, what you believe, what I believe. If you believe in God, I believe in God, we are one and we're, everybody's going to go to heaven. But that's the it's, doctrine of man, not, not of the word. Because the Word of God brings that the ch church that is going to go to heaven is described in the book of Ephesians chapter 5. That's right. I think we read it before. And right there when we read it, verses 25 and 26 and on, I know we can paraphrase it, brother. Okay. We don't have to read it. Well, basically, Christ is looking for a pure church, not with any spot or wrinkle or any such thing that He has cleansed and sanctified and washed by the Word. So, uh, but that's... Not what's taking what we see was taking place during the third and at the end of the third century, the fourth century, while the Roman Empire was disintegrating, was coming to an end. Barbarian nations were coming in from the north. You get you'd had the Franks becoming France, the Alamanni becoming Germany, the Angles and the Saxons becoming England, the Suevi becoming Portugal, and the Ostrogoths became Spain, and so the whole Western Europe empire was divided up, became the Ten Toes. 
but there was a power that was a church that came right there from the Romish, Roman Empire. And, and I don't think it is a coincidence that that church is still until today very proud, carry the name Roman Catholic Church. We're not inventing, dear viewers, this. And that, that's the official name of that church that came out of Rome, mm. the Roman Catholic Church. Notice this. It doesn't say, you know, let's say the Christian Apostolic Church. It says the Roman Catholic Church. That's right. That's it has that iron influence right there in the title. The wow. second phase of the Roman Empire, where it had dominion through the Dark Ages, deadly wound, that wound is healing even today. But again, uh, because God has so many good people in there, and, and because God loved His people, His children, that's the reason that He, he we want them, like us, to be aware that the doctrines and the teachings that has been coming out of there, that, 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 that they, were, they, they unite with the pagan traditions are not ple pleasant to God and are not teachings or doctrines that will sanctify anybody to go to heaven. That's exactly right, and that's what's in Daniel 2, verse 43, where it says, And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. The seed of men. What is that? Well, it must be the opposite of uh, the seed of God. No, look at this verse in 1 Peter 1.23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. incorruptible seed. There's two seeds. What is the incorruptible? Being born again of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. We are born again by incorruptible seed, the word of God. That's but the seed, the corruptible seed of men, the teachings is of men, teachings of men, traditions. So it is important what we believe and, and what we practice, and uh, if we re indeed wants to be of the pure clay. And Sunday keeping is a tradition of men, a seed of men. That is what the papacy uses to try and unite Europe. Sunday keeping laws are made to enforce Sunday keeping, but Sunday keeping can't unite. It does. They iron doesn't. It, they shall not cleave one to another, the Bible says. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I know all of you want to talk, but I had to come to the conclusion of this program. And my dear viewers, it is our prayer and our hope that you are going to be grounded in the pure, under the pure seat of the Word of God, not under man-made tradition. And it is also our prayer that you will come to the truth and be sanctified for that too. May God bless you all. Amen. Our Voice of the Eternal Gospel family thanks you for joining us. Generous contributors like you keep us broadcasting. Prayerfully consider supporting this ministry. Donations are tax deductible and can be sent to Voice of the Eternal Gospel, P.O. Box 15138, West Palm Beach, Florida, 33416. Our phone number is 1-866-7th-DAY-2. That's 1-866-784-3292. And our web address is voiceoftheeternalgospel.com.